Welcome, I'm Katherine Hadro, and this is EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I was reprimanded for refusing to prescribe emergency contraception to my patient, and I was told that I had traumatized her and broken the Hippocratic Oath. Shocking revelations, a Catholic healthcare professional says she was fired from her job at a Catholic hospital system after refusing to prescribe the morning after pill. Hear more in her first on-camera interview, and we discuss why conscience protections are critical for healthcare workers and all pro-lifers. Hey, hey, did you know one in three clowns will have a clown abortion in her lifetime? Clowning around, a Saturday Night Live skit attacks Texas's heartbeat law while highlighting pro-abortion rhetoric. Planned Parenthood applauds the act, I speak out. And he might be a saint. The postulator for venerable Dr. Jerome Lejeune tells us about her new book on how this pro-life scientist was both a man of science and conscience. We have a special report for this week's show and what is her first TV interview? Catholic healthcare professional Megan Kraft tells EWTN Pro-Life Weekly she was fired two years ago from a Catholic hospital system for not prescribing the morning after pill. Here is her story. 28-year-old Megan Kraft knew for a long time she wanted to work in the fields of medicine. I felt like it was a perfect combination of my desire to have a service profession where I could help others, but I also growing up loved the um, anatomy, science, physiology, and I felt like medicine was really a logical choice where I could meld those two passions of mine. Kraft attended PA school to become a physician assistant. And after graduating, the Catholic wife and mother entered into family medicine at her local Catholic hospital system, located in Sherwood, Oregon, in 2019, Providence Health and Services. Their Catholic identity and mission to serve those who are vulnerable and poor, as well as to participate in Christ's healing ministry, um, really resonated with me. This Catholic health care worker felt all the more convicted to work there when it seemed the workplace aligned well with her own faith mission. As part of this employment contract was a section that actually required um, my adherence to Catholic moral teaching, as well as the USCCB's um, ethical and religious directives for Catholic health care services. So it almost seemed too good to be true. But as Kraft continued on working at Providence Medical Group, she says she began seeing red flags, claiming the Catholic hospital system provided services contrary to church teaching. Sterilizations, such as a vasectomy, hormonal contraception, IUDs, and prescribed the morning after pill, which the church considers an abortifacient. That was really my first taste that some of these, um, what we would consider as Catholics, immoral procedures were being permitted um, and performed within the organization. I had a physician actually recommend that I refer a patient for an abortion if the patient wasn't happy about being pregnant. Kraft had planned to utilize life-affirming NAPRO technology in her work as a physician assistant. NAPRO technology uses a woman's biomarkers to monitor and maintain her reproductive and gynecological health, providing treatments that cooperate completely with the reproductive system and are in line with the church's teachings on life. But Megan says her application of NAPRO technology was not supported as she goes on to tell EWTN Pro-Life Weekly why and how she was fired only about six months after being hired. Megan, you were ultimately fired from the Catholic health care system you worked at in Portland, Oregon. Explain for us the situation you believe ultimately led to you being fired. So I had a conversation with my clinic's medical director as well as my clinic manager, um, you know, letting them know that I was still committed to upholding and following my conscience and my Catholic faith as well as the um, dictates of my employment contract and that I was committed to practicing medicine uh, in a way consistent with these as, as a Catholic. 
Shortly thereafter, I was notified and my entire clinic staff was notified that I would no longer be seen any woman of childbearing age between the ages of 12 and 50 for any medical reason. And it was actually stated that, um, uh, that this was because I was Catholic and did not prescribe contraception. During this new transition period, Kreft's schedule was changed, but she received permission to meet with a young woman for a follow-up who was already on her schedule, as it was considered continuity of care and unrelated to women's health and family planning. She mentioned at the end that um, she wanted um, a prescription for emergency contraception. And so I, uh, I let her know that that was not a service that I provided or that I referred for, but I offered other, um, other support and um, anything else I could do to help. And she actually ended up asking me if my refusal to, or, you know, me not um, prescribing Plan B, if that was due to my personal convictions and faith, or if that was a policy for the organization since it was a Catholic healthcare system. And I really had no issue saying that it was because the organization as a Catholic healthcare system did not offer this service. But when Kraft stepped out of the patient room to order her tests, another provider stepped in and wrote the patient a prescription for the morning after pill without any consultation. A few weeks later, Kraft was notified that she was scheduled to meet with her regional medical director and her clinic's medical director. I was reprimanded for refusing to prescribe emergency contraception to my patient, and I was told that I had traumatized her and broken the Hippocratic Oath. Mm -hmm. So following this situation, um, I was instructed by um, ultimatum of threat and termination to sign a document that would have required me to refer um, my patients who sought services that I didn't provide that it would have required me to refer them to other providers. And um, I, I let you know the administration know that I was unable to sign that form because from a bioethical standpoint, referral is cooperation with evil. And so that was not a bioethically viable option for me. Kreft says she consulted with the National Catholic Bioethics Center to find alternatives to transfer care so she did not need to refer services but could still care for her patients without violating her faith. All of these alternatives um, were not um, really considered, and thus I didn't. I, you know, I ended up not signing the form and was fired. And was instructed the next, the following morning. I was instructed to um, to go to the clinic the following morning and pick up all of my belongings. We reached out to Providence Medical Group for comment and were told, "quote Out of respect to our agreement with the former employee." Providence is not able to discuss this personnel matter. Kraft tells us she now hopes to be an advocate for religious liberty and to shed light on the assault on human life even happening within Catholic institutions. We reached out to the Archdiocese of Portland for comment on this case, but we were told they did not have a comment at this time. Joining us now is Lewis Brown, Executive Director for CMF Curo, a healthcare ministry. And joining us over Skype is Susan B. Anthony List's Federal Policy Director, Autumn Christensen. Thank you to you both for joining us for this important discussion. Lewis, I want to go to you first. We just heard Megan Kreft's story, who says she was fired from a Catholic hospital system for not prescribing the morning after pill. I know that you know Megan and her story well. Can you speak to this specific case and how common is this type of situation? Thanks, Catherine. Sadly, Megan's story is one of the worst uh, medical conscience and religious freedom violations that I've encountered. And I've done this work both uh, at Christ Medicus and also uh, pr previously at HHS. It's far too common having medical conscience rights violated, religious freedom rights violated, whether it's in healthcare systems, medical clinics in the most pro-life states or uh, the most pro-abortion states. Uh, sadly, these conscience rights, these religious freedom rights violations are happening uh, across the country and not just within uh, different medical systems and healthcare clinics. It's also impacting medical students. It's impacting students that are uh, in the mental health field or in the nursing field. Uh, it's a real tragedy. And also, uh, the big thing is, who does this hurt the most? Number one, it violates the basic civil right of conscience and religious freedom for these doctors, these nurses, these physicians' assistants. 
but it's also a horrible, horrible a violation uh, of the dignity and of the needs and of the uh, of, of the beauty uh, of the patients, of the most vulnerable. And so it's a very si serious situation that's happening across the country uh, far too often. And sadly, uh, I believe Megan's case uh, is uh, not quite the norm, uh, but happening all too often. Oh my goodness, that is some really powerful insight. And Lewis, I know you're a lawyer as well. Can you speak to what are the legal protections for pro-life healthcare workers and for their conscience rights? Yeah, at the federal level, those protections uh, are somewhat strong, but they could be stronger. So uh, first, we know that federal conscience law uh, broadly protects uh, the right of medical conscience and religious freedom in health care. We have the Weldon Amendment, which protects the conscience rights of medical professionals, of health care institutions, uh, from ha being forced, coerced to pay for, participate, fund uh, abortion. We also have uh, the Church Amendments, which broadly protects the conscience rights, the moral and religious convictions of medical professionals, health care institutions, st students that are studying uh, in health care fields. We also have state laws in certain states that have some level of broad, uh, occasionally and usually limited protection of conscience rights. Uh, but what we need is stronger protections at the state level, stronger protections at the federal level that allow medical professionals mm. to go in uh, and sue in state and federal court. It's also important that medical professionals who have experienced conscience rights violations file complaints at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services at its Office for Civil Rights. Absolutely. Autumn, can you speak to why should all pro-lifers care about conscience protection? This is critical for our movement. That's absolutely right. You know, Americans who um, stand up for their right to protect life uh, and to serve from the standpoint of somebody who does not want to be involved in the brutality of abortion, these are individuals who are standing in the gap. They're protecting the, the lives of, unborn, of the unborn, and they're also uh, improving health care. So by offering services that are life-affirming, they're serving women and families from the standpoint of preserving life, not ending it. And we all benefit from that. These are providers who are offering hope uh, and a future for the mother and for the child. And we can't get let the abortion lobby get away with imposing their life-destroying outlook on medicine as a whole and directly on pro-life providers by trying to bully them out of sticking by their principles, which benefit all of us. Mm. I want to expand this conversation on conscience to what's going on at Capitol Hill right now. The House held a procedural vote last week on President Biden's $1 trillion-plus infrastructure plan, known as the Build Back Better Infrastructure Package. Democrats hope to send this package to the Senate soon. Autumn, infrastructure typically is about repairing roads and bridges, but I understand you have serious pro-life concerns with this. What are they? Well, this package that's sometimes referred to as social infrastructure is a large funding bill that contains all sorts of social programs, included among them are programs related to um, public health, programs to train medical professionals, programs to uh, fund healthcare activities. And because there's no language like the Hyde Amendment, which you are familiar with, I know, um, that says no funding for abortion, those funds are completely unprotected and available for use. Mm -hmm. And we know this administration would use them for that purpose to fund abortion, train um, physicians and medical professionals in doing abortions, make abortions more widely, avail uh, widely available. And uh, really just kind of take an ax to the long-standing policy of not funding abortion. So remember the status quo since the mid-1970s has been that we do not fund abortion. But if you exclude language that says, like the Hyde Amendment, no funding for abortion, if you just say, here's health care money, spend it as you'd like, the way that the courts and administrations have interpreted that, it means spend it on abortion, and we cannot allow that. So we are working very, very hard to expose this reality about the bill. Mm. Lewis, do you have concerns with the Builds Back Better infrastructure package when it comes to conscience protections? Yeah, I have, I have very serious concerns. We don't know the final legislative text, and so on some level, um, some of this is based on past history, some of this is based on conjecture. We remember that the Affordable Care Act, there was this big debate, is there abortion in the bill? And there's, you know, a lot of news outlets says, well, there's no abortion in the bill. And then what do we have? A couple years later, a GAO study is showing that in in five states, there were no pro-life health care plans offers on those state exchanges. And Autumn's completely correct. For consumers, 
uh, that have a right to exercise their conscience when it comes to their health care choices and not fund abortion. The lack of the Hyde Amendment um, in, this uh, in this potential uh, package is devastating, and it's devastating to unborn lives. What's also potentially devastating is if there is, and we don't know for sure, but if there winds up being provisions in this legislation that forces medical professionals to perform medical procedures, or excuse me, procedures that aren't actually healthcare procedures that they believe to be unethical uh, and also harmful to the patient, that would have a grave uh, impact on conscience rights mm. and religious freedom rights. Autumn, last question to you. We have less than a minute. Your quick reaction to last week's election results. Are more Americans prioritizing life? Yes, last week, uh, the election in Virginia was very encouraging. We saw pro-life candidates at the top of the ticket win across the board. Um, and that was after then-candidate, now Governor-elect Youngkin, successfully exposed the abortion extremism of Terry McAuliffe. Um, and at the same time, McAuliffe was running ads. If you live in the Virginia area, you will have seen ad after ad after ad that focused on abortion and abortion rights and the desire to expand abortion in the state. And that effort failed spectacularly. If you look at exit polls, we know that those who stated abortion was their number one issue. They swung 17 percent in favor of the pro-life candidate. So even after inundating the airwaves with an abortion agenda, it was the pro-life voters that turned out and helped to put Youngkin across the finish line. Really powerful insights there. Lewis Brown and Autumn Christensen, thank you to you both. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. We need your prayers more than ever, especially as we prepare for the upcoming Supreme Court abortion case, Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. This case on December 1st will pose a direct challenge to Roe versus Wade and potentially will have major consequences for the pro-life cause. That brings us to this week's call to action. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com to find out how you can join in praying for the unborn and the U.S. Supreme Court ahead of the Dobbs versus Whole Woman's Health abortion case. When you go to ProLifeWeekly.com, you will get all the details for a weekly nationwide prayer call happening every Monday at 8.30 p.m. Eastern, led by Susan B. Anthony List President Marjorie Danenfelser. Join this important weekly prayer call every Monday evening at 8.30 p.m. Eastern by calling 833-380-0736. You can go to ProLifeWeekly.com for that phone number again and for all the prayer call details. Coming up, a disturbing skit on Saturday Night Live mocks Texas's heartbeat law and amplifies pro-abortion propaganda. I speak out. Plus, we take a look at the life of venerable Jerome Lejeune through a newly released book. We speak with the postulator of his sainthood cause and author behind this book right after this. Welcome back to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Katherine Hadro. Many media outlets are praising Saturday Night Live's skit featuring a, quote, clown abortion, but it's not all fun and jokes. That is this week's Speak Out segment. Saturday Night Live featured a weekend update segment with a new character, Goober the Clown, who got an abortion at age 23. Goober was portrayed by comedian Cicely Strong, who took jabs at Texas's heartbeat law. Take a listen. I know I wouldn't be a clown on TV here today if it weren't for the abortion I had the day before my 23rd birthday. Clowns have been helping each other end their pregnancies since the caves. It's going to happen, so it ought to be safe, legal, and accessible. Media outlets, which include CNN and The Daily Beast, praised the SNL skit, calling it, quote, brilliant, an instant classic, and buzzworthy. Planned Parenthood's president, Alexis McGill Johnson, also chimed in and applauded the skit. In a tweet, she wrote, our stories power our fights for justice and freedom. Even when no joke, they make us laugh, too. This skit, which is being hailed as effective political commentary, is veiled as a joke, as comedy. It is only because our society refuses to define abortion that people can even rationalize joking about it. 
the pro-abortion lobby thrives on using euphemisms, and this is a perfect example. Saying a clown instead of a woman, and saying abortion instead of calling it what it is, the killing of an unborn baby when she is still inside her mother's womb. We need to strip away any euphemisms and speak about this most important issue with only clarity and truth. This skit on Saturday Night Live perpetuated the idea that abortion is sometimes necessary for a woman to succeed and to fulfill her dreams. But that is a lie from the depths of hell. We in the pro-life movement need to have only mercy for women who have believed that lie. We need to offer them tools to heal and to have hope. Because many women have undergone abortions, but that doesn't mean we lie to them about what abortion is and attempt to normalize the killing of the unborn, even with jokes on a major comedy show. Comedian Cicely Strong, who portrayed Goober the Clown, confirmed on Instagram this week that her story and the SNL skit was actually personal. Let us keep Cicely in particular in prayer, because abortion never helps women, and abortion is never a punchline. The postulator of venerable Dr. Jerome Lejeune's sainthood cause is sharing details about the pro-life scientist's life in a new book. Author O. Dugo wrote about Dr. Lejeune and her new book, Jerome Lejeune, A Man of Science and Conscience. Lejeune had many accomplishments during his lifetime, which include the discovery of the extra chromosome, which causes Down syndrome. He was nominated twice for the Nobel Peace Prize. He founded and ran the Pontifical Academy for Life in Rome, among many other achievements. Lejeune died in 1994 and today is considered a venerable in the Catholic Church. Joining us now on Zoom is O. Dugo, the postulator at four venerable Dr. Jerome Lejeune and author of the new book, Jerome Lejeune, A Man of Science and Conscience. Thank you so much for joining us. You have spent 14 years conducting research, doing interviews and compiling evidence for Lejeune's cause. Tell us first off, why do you believe he might be a saint? Yeah, Jerome Lejeune, as a, um, a physician and scientist, is, for me, a luminous and heroic uh, apostle of the gospel of life. It's, it was really incredible. As a physician, he, was, he had an unconditional love for his little passion with Down syndrome, who he loved so much without uh, no criteria of age, of illness, of course. And he, he devoted, he dedicated all his life for them. And I, I think that we can say that he saw in the, he saw the suffering face of Christ of each of his patients. And um, I think we can say that he was a servant of life for that. And as a great scientist, he, he showed the deep harmony between faith and science. And he always used his science for the for the good of his patients. Mm. And um, I think that we, I was really impressed by the sanctity of the intelligence of Jerome Lejeune. Mm. Jerome Lejeune's intelligence was magnetized by the, by the truth. And, um, and this made him very free free to always find the truth and always choose it and uh, despite of all the problems and all the, all the attacks he, he got for that and for that I, I think we can say that he was a, a servant of the truth and one of the best thing of uh, Jerome John is the way he, he follow his conscience uh, as a doctor faithful to the Hippocratic uh, oath that you know is discovered of the uh, trisomy 21 of the yeah. cause of down syndrome um, unfortunately 10 years later was used against children because so many scientists mm. and geneticists use this discovery to for the abortion of this baby mm. and for jean Lejeune, it was so hard so like a, a nightmare because he devoted all his life for these children and for this uh, discovery and this discovery was return uh, against these babies. So for him, it was absolutely horrible. And he decided to, to put all his intelligence, all, all his love in the battle and to become the, the most, the, the most maybe intelligent and most mm. uh, courageous advocate in the world. And he knew that uh, he will get so many trouble doing that, but yeah. he did it. 
So it was very heroic. And I, I think that it's heroic, heroicity uh, who is the mark of his sanctity. Mm. And I, I love to, 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 to talk about his hope because he knew that, unfortunately, there will be so many babies who will be aborted. Mm. And for him, it was awful to think about it. But he never lost uh, hope. And uh, in the contrary, he gave so much hope to the parents, to the patients, to the physicians who want to serve life. And, um, you know, he, he used to say, uh, don't, be, don't be afraid. Uh, who You who are for the life, you have the, the, the perils of, the, of truth and uh, life will win. So mm -hmm. it's a, also uh, a good testimony for, yeah. for hope and we need that today. A absolutely. And Ode, I understand he was a close friend of St. John Paul II. Can you speak about their friendship? Yes, um, I think that both both were lovers of life and both admired the beauty of uh, of life, human life, but also all the creation, and uh, and both have the great sense of humor and the same taste for theater, and both were very very were genius. So when they met, they they fell in love, <laughs> if I can say. It. And uh, it was a very beautiful uh, friendship. And when Jerome Jean died on uh, Easter 1994, mm -hmm. uh, the Pope was very upset and, uh, and he wrote a beautiful letter to the Archbishop Cardinal of Paris and telling that, uh, of course, Jerome Jean, who died the, the early morning of Easter, uh, was a sign of his um, beautiful life in the service of life, of human life. And when he went, when the Pope went in France for the World Youth Day in 1997, he absolutely wanted to go to, uh, to kneel in front of the Jerusalem grave, and he made it. So it was, of course, uh, uh, an important sign of their friendship, but more that the friendship. It was a sign that wow. John Paul II uh, considered Jerusalem like a, a great mm. Catholic, a great servant of life and wow. servant of God. What a beautiful friendship. And I, I want to let our viewers know you can get Ode's book, Jerome Lejeune, A Man of Science and Conscience, at EWTN's religious catalog at EWTNRC.com. It is item number 4118. Ode de Gaulle, postulator for Jerome Lejeune and author of Jerome Lejeune, A Man of Science and Conscience. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. God bless. That does it for this edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. Until next time, we'd love to hear from you. Find us on social media at EWTN Pro-Life on all social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or there. You can also send us a message by emailing prolifeweekly at EWTN.com. We love to hear from you. Remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.